I'm here at the G3 conference with uh, Mike Riccardi. Mike is a friend. He's a professor of theology at the Master's Seminary. And we're just going to talk theology, a couple of topics that I want to cover, including especially what you're covering today. So, Mike, thank you for stopping by the Greenville Seminary booth. You are welcome anytime. Thanks, brother. I appreciate being here. I wanted to talk to you about your topic here at G3, which is definite atonement. And this is controversial in, a num in, in broader evangelicalism for sure. So I want to start with that. Why is this a difficult topic for many to accept? Yeah, I think there's, a, there's like a, a charitable answer to that, and then there's like a not so charitable answer to that. I think the charitable answer to that is there are a lot of people who see the death of Christ cast in universalistic terms, like in, in the scriptures, like terms like all and world, you know, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And, you know, Jesus gave his life as a ransom for all, you know, in First Timothy 2. And so I think um, partly folks are just, they just, it seems like on its face to say that Jesus died for the elect alone and not all without exception is uh, is just blatantly contrary to, to the to those passages. Um, I also think that they that people struggle with how is it that I can preach the gospel to all without exception, which I agree we ought to do. But how can we do that consistently if we don't believe Jesus at least died, uh, you know, for all without exception in some in some sense to sort of give them a chance, right? Um, so I think that, that it's hard to accept because universalistic passages and universal gospel offer. And I think there are answers to that. I think that those, those universalistic passages when understood in context and certainly in the light of the rest of Scripture's teaching about the design and nature of the atonement prohibit us from understanding them in an absolutely universal sense. Uh, and, and so, you know, we could talk about that for a long time. And then, and then a universal gospel offer is, is something that uh, does not need a coextensive provision in order to do, right? I can tell anybody, if you repent and believe in Jesus, uh, you will be saved. And it has, it has no, that's making no comment on the extent of the atonement, limited or particular or uh, universal. So uh, I think those, there are those issues. But, but underneath that, I think that people have a hard time with it because it just doesn't seem fair. It seems like, wait a second, if my salvation is is absolutely determined by God so much so that Jesus didn't even die for the reprobate, for the non-elect, well then, you know, how, how is it fair? I mean, I think they conceive of salvation as Jesus died to give us a chance, and it depends on what really what we do in response as the determining cause of our salvation. And that's just a really bad assumption. That's just a really unbiblical, sort of maybe democratically inspired understanding of fairness rather than what God has revealed to us in his word. So let me pull the thread of each of those arguments. You talked about the biblical one, and, and, and like you said, we don't have time to go through every passage. But let's just touch on two, because you mentioned or alluded to two. The idea of um, God's love for the world. Can you address that one? And then I'll, I'll ask you another one that is often considered to be one of the most difficult passages in 1 John 2. And, and, and he's the propitiation, not for our sins only, but also for those of the world. So both using that term world. Yeah. But can you walk us through your your understanding of that? Sure. So, I mean... Even, so in John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So there, there is particularism in that verse, right? Because whoever believes, so who, who are the ones who are going to believe? Is that, is that somehow not determined? Is that, is that sort of open and we decide of our own free will? Well, well no, Acts 13, 48, as many who were appointed to eternal life believed. And, and uh, by grace you're saved through faith, this not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. So, so faith is, is exercised by man, but it's a gift of God according to his eternal appointment. So if Jesus, if God so loved the world that he gave his son to die for the believing ones, I'm not sure how that's an expression of, 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 a, of love for all without exception when not all without exception will believe, right? So the, I think Jesus is there talking to Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews, who expects that God's love terminates upon the nation of Israel alone because uh, that's what Judaism would have, would have taught as the covenant nation, right? Before the cross, you join Israel. You join the covenant people of God and you worship Yahweh. But Jesus comes and says, no, 
I, I'm, I'm dying not just for the nation of Israel, but for the whole world. Not everybody who's ever lived in the whole world throughout history, but both Jew and Gentile, right? And, uh, and, and, who, and who were they who, who were to have the benefits of Christ's death? The believers who are elect of God, who were chosen by God, appointed to believe, and then given that sovereign gift of faith. And then with 1 John 2, 2, the, the key here, this is one of my favorite particular redemption verses because, the, you know, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins. Well, what is propitiation? Before we run too quickly to say whom propitiation is for, let's define what propitiation is. And if we do that, we'll find out whom it's for. Now, everywhere in the scriptures, propitiation is the efficacious satisfaction of divine wrath. There is anger that burns hot against sin from God, and propitiation is that which appeases that anger, satisfies that justice by bearing the, the, the cursed effects of that in oneself. And so when Christ is said to be the propitiation, it's referring to his death on the cross, whereby he takes the wrath of God upon himself in, as a substitute for his people. So if, if I experience the wrath of God on my sins in hell, wrath against me has not been propitiated just by definition. There is, if, if anger is unsatisfied such that I will experience it in hell, well then it's not satisfied, it's not been appeased. And so Jesus in fact is not the propitiation of the sins or for the sins for all people without exception who's ever, who ever lived in the world. So the question is, well then what do you do with the phrase, right? Whole world. Well, as long as we recognize that propitiation means efficacious satisfaction of wrath and we agree that not everybody has their wrath satisfied because sadly the gate is wide and the, and the way is broad that leads to destruction and many find it, well then we have to say, what do we do? Do we modify our understanding of propitiation to, to mean what is basically a potential propitiation or do we modify our understanding of whole world as something other than all without exception? And I think that there's more biblical warrant to modify our understanding of whole world and not understand it as an absolutely universal referent um, than, than there is. There's more warrant for that than to redo our understanding of propitiation to give it a meaning that it never means anywhere else. So nowhere else is the term used to mean anything other than wrath is satisfied. But plenty of other times, this, the apostles use universalistic language to refer to something other than absolutely everybody. And in fact, John does it in the very same letter, right? The whole world lies in the power of the evil one, 1 John 5, 19. And you say, does that include the apostles? Does that include the believers? Maybe in some sense in which, you know, we're part of the world that Satan rules. But the, no, because the immediately preceding verse in John, 1 John 5, 18 says, you know, the, the, the no one born of God is, I think, I don't know if it says, is overcome or something. He says the evil one does not touch him. So everyone who is born of God, the evil one does not touch. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. How can that be unless John conceives of the ones born of God as distinct from the whole world? So there's not, there's a non-absolutely universal sense of whole world in this very same epistle, in the very same context, you know, by the same author, obviously. And when you, when you dig further into the way that the, the syntax of 1 John 2, 2, if you compare it with John 11, 49 to 52, where Caiaphas is making that prophecy and John gives us this comment that he didn't prophesy this on his own because he was high priest that year. And he says, and, and, and he says don't you realize everyone that it's more expedient for one man to die for the nation and not for the nation only. And then uh, and, oh, John comments, and not for the nation only, but also to gather together all the children of God who were scattered abroad. So it's a very, very similar syntax from the same author around the same time in the same context from the Apostle John, where everything is the same except, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world, and not for the nation only, but also for the, ch the, the children of God scattered abroad. I argue that those have the same referent, that the whole world means the children of God scattered throughout the whole world. All right, so we've talked a little bit about exegesis. You, you said already that this is not a deterrent to a free offer of the gospel. In fact, it exists it, it, happily yeah. it, with a free offer of the gospel. 
so what's the importance of it? Why is it? Why do we need to defend it? Those are the things we're defending it against. Those are the false accusations against definite atonement. But why is it such a precious document uh, uh, doctrine for yeah. us? Be because it, because it's all our hope, right? If if indeed you say that Jesus died for all without exception, and not all without exception are saved, then something other than Jesus' death is the determinative cause of our salvation. If he's done the same thing for me as he's done for the people in hell, then it's not something that God has done that makes the difference in my eternal destiny. That, that burden gets thrust back upon the sinner. And for those of us who know ourselves as sinful as we are, we do not need a salvation that's teed up for us. We don't need an alley-oop of salvation which we slam home, right? We need a, we need a, a sovereign savior who, who doesn't provide possibilities or potentialities, who doesn't open doors or make ways for salvation. We need a Savior who saves definitively, right? Who accomplishes salvation and doesn't merely provide it as if it were sort of you can take it or leave it. You know, I, if, if propitiation in 1 John 2, 2 is for all without exception, but there are some who experience wrath, then propitiation must be modified to mean a potential propitiation. And I don't need a potential propitiation. I need an actual propitiation. I need a, a sacrifice that actually puts away God's wrath in my, in my case. And, and so when you offer somebody salvation, it's very, very different than to offer them the opportunity of salvation if they fill in the blank. I mean, that's, that's a, it's not quite salvation by works, but it, it's certainly heading in that direction and taking, the, and taking the onus and burden off of the strong shoulders of the Savior and putting them back on the shoulders of the sinner. Well, I suppose it could be said that it's, there's an inconsistency there, and we're glad there's an inconsistency among our four-point Calvinistic brothers. Uh, we're glad for the inconsistency, but there is a more consistent and biblical way of articulating salvation. Right. And, and do, would you say that understanding salvation in this way, which is how the Bible presents it, is actually an inducement or a, or a, or a fuel for evangelism and a fuel? Not, not only does it not detract from the free offer of the gospel, but perhaps it enlivens the free offer of the yeah, gospel. It, it makes a better offer. You think about what motivated Paul in his evangelistic ministry, right? The, for the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, sort of ironically using universalistic language there, but therefore all died. So one died for all with, with, it, with, with such an effect that everyone for whom he died, died with him and in him, which does not speak of all without exception. Not all without exception die in and with Christ when he dies. And so that, that is speaking about a particular redemption. And he says, the fact that I have an efficacious, personal, particular redemption b purchased by Christ, the Christ who knows his sheep by name, John 10, 3, the Christ who takes names to the cross, right, who as our great high priest has over the breastplate, as it were, the, the names of his 12 tribes of Israel, his elect, right? My name is graven on his hand. My name is written on his heart. That, Paul says, gets me up in the morning. That love of Christ for us controls me that, that when I'm beaten and flogged and stoned and whipped, right? That I get back up for more because this is a glorious gospel. That's not just, I died to save empty seats for you, whoever might decide to put themselves in them, but I died specifically and personally for you before the foundation of the world, before it was determined and I did this before you were born, before you existed, before you could have done anything to privilege yourself or prejudice me in, in a favorable direction, right? Salvation is of the Lord. And, and again, that offer of come to a Christ who has accomplished all is m a much better offer than come to a Christ who has made a way for you to finish what he started. That's probably the best place to end, but I do want to ask one last question, which is more a question of, of presentation. So as we've been talking, we've talked about it in terms of definite atonement, particular redemption. And both of those, I think, are excellent terms for describing what we mean biblically. The most commonly used term is limited atonement. 
would you uh, is is that a term that you would embrace as well, or what do you what do you see as the problems in that? Because you know, of course, that when this is presented, that that term is something that people have hangups with. Yeah. So I think properly defined, it can be okay. But I think for many people, they just they just hear it as there is something deficient in the atonement. There is something that Christ failed to do that uh, makes it limited in some way. But in, in the rea- I mean, the reason why it's used that way is because the extent of it is limited to those who actually partake of its benefits. That's that's a proper use of the term. But what we're not saying about the atonement as as the nature of the atonement or as the sufficiency of the atonement, that's not limited, right? What, what, in fact, A. A. Hodge has this famous line that says, it's not we who teach a limited atonement, it's our opponents. That must be a limited redemption indeed, which leaves the majority for whom it's been offered in hell forever. Um, yeah, Spurgeon said the same thing, you know, who, who, who limits the atonement? You know, it, you may be saved if, and then follow conditions. We say the ones Christ died for will never run the hazard of anything but being saved. Who, who, who limits the atonement? In reality, the, you know, the, the Calvinist, the, the, the particularist, uh, by, by keeping the extent particular makes it so that the efficacy of the atonement is unlimited. Right? Everyone for whom it's, it's offered, everyone for whom it's, it's accomplished, um, it brings them all the way home to heaven for certain. With the Arminian understanding or the non-Calvinist understanding, the, the uh, extent is unlimited and that sounds very magnanimous and, and loving and broad. But the efficacy of it is very limited. It doesn't. It doesn't bring you all the way home to heaven. It's the classic illustration of, you know, the uh, the wide bridge that fits everybody on it, but only goes halfway across the river, versus the narrow bridge that goes all the way across. Limited in some degree, yes, in the, in its extent to whom it extends. Not everybody is saved. Unlimited in its power and efficacy and, and saving might. Mike Riccardi, thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure.